very happy to tea talk. And today we have with us Dr. Mohan Raj, con doc consultant and psychiatrist who helps transgender people to get GD certificates. So why do we need GD certificate? What is GD certificate and why do how do we get it? So we'll discuss all these questions with Dr. Taru, uh, Dr. Mohan Raj. And welcome Dr. Mohan Raj to our live today. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. You're welcome. And uh, I want you to give a small introduction about yourself to our, uh, to our viewers to know who you are. Oh, you want me to introduce? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in Chennai. Uh, I studied in Stanley Medical College, Chennai. And for my MBBS, then I went to Nimhans for my uh, MD psychiatry, did my DNB there, Diplomated National Board. Then I uh, did taught three years in Nimhans as a senior resident. From 2000, I've been in practice in Chennai. And uh, my other interests are I've been uh, doing a lot of preventive work, like speaking in schools, colleges about identifying problems early, treating problems, parenting issues. Uh, preventive psychiatry is my main interest. Uh, other than psychiatry, I cycle quite a bit. Uh, I'm a cyclist. Uh, I was a mountaineer earlier. That's about it. Nice, nice, really yeah. nice. And uh, now coming to uh, transgender people, transgender patients, how did you get into treating transgender pe uh, people? And, and what kind of support or education or resources did you have while you started treating transgender pe people? Uh, see, I don't remember exactly who was the first patient in Chennai, but we have seen transgenders while in advance, while in training. And here I don't remember who, but one, I remember one of the person was in college and had this issue, wanted to have gender dysphoria. And it was a trans woman later. So it was still a male while he was in the college and he had confided in one of the professors and the professor took the trouble of bringing him and facilitating. The professor also talked to his parents. Uh, they were very reluctant and the professor counseled them, then brought to me and I spoke to the parents. So this is one of the, I don't know whether it was the first or one of the earlier ones. Uh, then there have been people on and off. I don't know. Uh, we have seen people with transgender issue, gender dysphoria, right from my my PG days, postgraduate days. Okay. And what kind of resources, when this patient ends up in your clinic, did you have any resources to help you to guide the patient or what? Because I can imagine it does uh, quite resource, a for the medical community. Uh, no, resource in terms of uh, see, psychiatry, we had in the hands, we had good exposure to all issues, sexual orientation issues, sexual identity issues. So we were fairly open and very, very non judgmental way is what that's the kind of training that is imparted in the hands. So that is there. Then, Indian Psychiatric Society also, as a whole, whole country, we have. We have taken certain stand, which is very non-judgmental. Uh, we don't see this as an illness. We don't see sexual orientation as an illness, sexual identity as an illness, rather as a difficulty, rather as a condition, which has to be helped if they want. Like orientation, we don't treat unless they have a lot of distress about it. But sexual identity, if it is genuinely a, a sexual identity, gender dysphoria, then if they want to change, we help and facilitate because the law also requires two psychiatrists to give a certificate. See, why the certificate is, this is to say it is gender dysphoria and nothing else. Uh, because many times, see, because they will go through hormone therapy and surgery, which are irreversible, both 
So since before going to reversible therapy, they need like not only for transgender, even for some uh, plastic surgery for something as like changing their nose size or ear. Sometimes plastic surgeon will want an opinion because there are two conditions, three, four conditions which can mimic. So we need to rule all of them out. So one of them is called body dysmorphophobia. That is. Uh, the name might sound a little odd, but uh, where they feel something is wrong with their body in terms of size of their face, nose size, ear size, and they will keep going behind plastic surgeon to have repeated surgery. And sometimes they're not happy, they will say, no, no, give my old nose back. So to avoid these, they will ask for a psychiatric consultation. That's for routine plastic surgery. Here again, it is the irreversible nature of the surgery and the hormonal treatment. It's a safeguard that they want to make sure that it's not the body dysmorphophobia is a psychotic condition where a person has a false fixed belief that something is different about the way he looks or she looks. So that is something which we need to rule out. Then there is a condition called obsessive compulsive disorder where a person can have recurrent thought about something. It can be the theme can be anything. Theme can be a line from a song. It can be an image or sometimes can be a doubt. Am I, a, am I really a man? I am a really a woman. So that's another thing we need to do. So basically our certificate would say they don't have anything else. They are only genetic. Support. So basically we are ruling out other things. And the certificate, we also say that uh, they are fully aware of the procedure and the irreversible nature. And they are in their clear mind when they have sought this. That's something which uh, most surgeons or physicians before starting, they will want to know whether the person is fully aware of whatever is going on and they know the consequences of the treatment also. Okay, so, so as psychiatrist, I, 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 is a more, yeah, psychiatrist is more like a screening. Okay, so as far as I understand, it's it's more of ruling out other conditions than diagnosis, diagnosing someone's gender dysphoria. Yes, okay. both diagnosing gender dysphoria in the process, ruling out other kinds. It's not psychotic disorder, it's not OCD. Okay. And uh, now, how long does it take to get a gender dysphoria certificate or a diagnosis of gender dysphoria? And how often are these sessions? Uh, see, initial session I normally see for half an hour, 45 minutes or so. Uh, that itself is good enough. With the, if the history is very clear, and if it's clearly gender dysphoria, that's enough. But if I'm in a doubt, I might see them one more time. If okay. at all. So one uh, clinical one examination one. is good enough. I don't do a psychometry. See, sometimes psychologists can assess you on various parameters. I don't do that. Okay. So uh, it's just one session or max two sessions of yeah. consultations. Yes. Okay. And how much does this cost a patient if uh, yeah the it's consultation. like my other consultations like like my routine psychiatric consultation first consultation i charge two thousand for about half an hour if it's more accordingly and reviews if at all there are i charge about thousand two hundred it's according to time if it's half an hour two thousand otherwise thousand two hundred thousand so it's like any other other consultation which i do No, no, your sound suddenly became metallic. Can you repeat that? Uh, okay. If you have an issue or an appointment. Yeah, uh, they can reach my clinic number. Should I tell my number? Yeah, it's 95. Uh, no. 
I can give my number to you and you can yeah. send it to whoever wants. Yeah, that's my number. Yeah. That's yeah. the yeah. clinic number. Uh, others can see the screen, yeah. is it? Okay. They can fix an yeah. appointment others and uh, then they will tell how to go about it. Okay. All right. So, and do you also do online consultation or does someone have to come to your clinic, sir? Yeah. See, online for transgender certificate, I was doing only during COVID uh, pandemic, prayer that, that time. Ideally, it's better I see a person in person and give. During that break for about one year, one and a half years, I was giving online also. Okay. But to make okay. sure everything is proper, if they don't get into problem later, it's better I see mm -hmm. them in person. And that I think applies okay. for most psychiatrists. Okay. And what do you usually do, do during the sessions? Is it uh, what kind of questions to expect? And is it more diagnostic yeah. or more preparing the patient to make uh, educated more, decision? More diagnostic. First is to, I normally let them tell about their history, like how they felt. When did they first come to know about this? When did they first feel something was different in them? So it will be like any other problem that they narrate their history. And then wherever I have doubts, I clarify. Uh, basically towards a, di a diagnostic interview with also diagnostic interview includes ruling out other diagnoses. Okay. Later, there are sometimes people ask me to help them to uh, convince their parents, if parents are not convinced. At that time, I would probably have a second session where the parents come in and I explain to them what this condition is all about. Okay. And is it easy to explain to someone's parents that Very which difficult. child could... Very difficult, yeah. but we try. Uh, some parents are already primed by the person themselves. They would have explained. They would have shown them a lot of literature. And as I told in a previous example, the professor of that person also had talked to the parents. So they were primed. And uh, so like basically letting them accept and explaining to them the consequences of not going ahead and going ahead. So many parents still have a hang up, they would never accept. Or and sometimes they refuse to come and see also, even if the person is wanting, they might not come. Okay. And is there a requirement for the parents to come to see you? Because we have heard from some people that sometimes psychiatrists, even if the uh, patient is 40 year old, Sometimes the psychiatrists insist that their parents have to come to talk to the psychiatrist. Is there a requirement as such like that? Uh, no. To give the certificate, no. No requirement because as I understand, if a person is adult, legally adult, uh, there isn't. In, in India, sometimes if they are closely knit families, they are still under, like they are 20, 25 they are still being looked after by the parents. If parents are going to finance them, then they would want to bring their parents. It's not my requirement. I'm not insisting parents should come. If the person thinks that parents are the, going to take care of the surgery and the treatment, then they will want the parents to be involved. So at that condition, like it's not a pre-requirement. Okay. If somebody has genuine gender dysphoria, then I tell them, explain to your parents about the condition, educate them. But it's not like 40 asking for parents or even I would say in 30 asking for parents to come and consult. I, I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, we think the same. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, what about people below 18? Do you ever get patients who are below 18? Uh, sometimes, but I tell them they need to wait. If if they have parents' approval, that's different. But if they don't have parents' approval, it will be difficult. Even legally, it's not sustainable. 
So not only me, but endocrinologists or surgeons will hesitate because you can get into a lot of legal issues. Yeah, yeah. And uh, if the parents are uh, agreeing and if they're below 18, then the consultation is possible, you say? Uh, see, there are times people come who are not in touch with parents. Parents are far away. They don't want to involve parents. So certification is possible. Okay. All right. And for the certification for getting the letter of gender dysphoria, is there any uh, biochemical or radiological or any uh, blood investigations or sonography or anything required? It's not mandatory, but in case there is a doubt about certain conditions, then a hormone test like basic ones like thyroid, sexual hormones, it's not mandatory for the diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Because physical features would tell you that most of the hormones are working fine. So I don't normally do. Okay. And what is it usually that with blood tests that that has to be ruled out? Like, is there any conditions that... Yeah. You are asking about hormone tests. Yeah. See, because the person will also be seeing an endocrinologist. Now, the endocrinologists will start hormone, re hormone therapy only after they have a baseline of most of the hormones. Not only sex hormones, they will, they will have a wide variety because giving anything will have impact on other hormones. So they would do a panel. So sometimes I am not the first person who is seeing them. They might have approached an endocrinologist and the endocrinologist would have done the basic workup and they would say you need to get like two psychiatrists to opine and they would send so by then the person knows a lot about the concerned person would have learned a lot about the biochemical and the hormone factors because the endocrinologist would have educated them sometimes rarely they meet the surgeon first and the surgeon will put put them across to an endocrinologist and the psychiatrist okay. so if they're coming to me first then i explain to them about uh, what the endocrine treatment would involve and uh, and what the surgery would involve and it cannot be reversed. Okay. Um, All right. Because uh, previously we've heard from some patients that uh, uh, the psychiatrist they went to wanted to rule out any intersex conditions and then yeah. they had to do some uh, more blood investigations or uh, so that's not mandatory for a psychiatrist. Not mandatory. More if you're very mandatory. clear, if it's very clear, the biological sex is very clear, you don't have to. Okay. All right. Like I ask them and I trust. So I don't do a physical examination of genitalia to rule out intersex and all because they would give you a clear history of and also secondary sexual characteristics with people. Okay. And now I have a question that I get from a lot of parents, you know, like a lot of parents want a cure for their transgender children. Uh, so the question is, is it possible to cure gender dysphoria to live a happy and content life without a gender transition? So this is a, a controversial question, but we get it from parents. So what do you have to say some for someone like that? Uh, yeah, see if, uh, leave alone the certificate aspect, if somebody comes and says, I want child has gender dysphoria and had to be cured, uh, I would rather spend time with the parents, educating them about what is gender dysphoria, give them literature to read about gender dysphoria, because you cannot cure. First of all, it's not an illness to be cured. It's a condition and we still don't know what. There are lots of literature on studies looking at whether it could be a genetic problem, it could be a biochemical problem, and everything has come out as zero. We don't still, like it's not an illness to be cured. So it's a condition. You can't cure. Only thing is if somebody is not going to go through the changes, then you can probably tell them how to cope with the condition. 
how to cope by continuing with the same biological that is that is their choice uh, i as a psychiatrist shouldn't say continue if it's a person who is biologically male but is a trans woman i am not the one who should be saying cope with being a woman a male it's their choice if they are taking that choice then you could tell them how to cope with it but uh we don't come in and we don't say we can cure because that you cannot it's like i'll draw parallel here sometime back sometime meaning 20 30 years back homosexuality was supposed to be treatable like you can cure or you can do and it was considered like they people considered it like a delusion trying to give antipsychotic people considered it like an obsession continue to give anti obsessional drugs nothing was giving any kind of benefit there are behavioral therapies now the official stand world over of psychiatrist is it's not an illness it's a condition and let them be where don't interfere similarly here the problem is why we come into the picture in the first place is because the law requires two certificates before treatment is started otherwise there's no role for a psychiatrist there yeah yeah Uh, that's what sometimes yeah. yes sir yes sometimes uh, we yeah. also because we, this is a question we get repeatedly from parents we just say the only cure uh, is to let the no, person live happy hello no no i i'm not able to hear you clearly okay uh, is it better yeah, now can you sir? also call me i would probably on the phone yeah yeah better now much better okay yeah. okay so is it uh, okay so what i said was uh, when we get questions like that we just say let your child live the life they want that's the only cure <laughs> so again the words went off can you also call me on the mobile so yeah sure sure get sure, the sir. sound sure. stream so that yeah okay Uh, just give me a minute sir on on the whatsapp is it uh on direct phone i'm calling you no no i i have not got a call no no you might have called the other number my okay. phone my mobile is 938 starting with that yeah yeah i'm calling that that's hello hello yes 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 sir so uh, no, i have another I question have for another you question. uh that is uh, sometimes we've sometimes heard from people heard that uh, during gender dysphoria consultation no no Can now you? this itself is better anyway i listen to one of it yeah tell me again sometimes okay. okay we get a question saying that uh, 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 that the psychiatrist asked them to undress to uh, examine if there is any intersex conditions or not is it a requirement to undress in front of a psychiatrist because especially for trans men it can be really really in uh, dysphoric to dress undress in front of psychiatrist characteristics are very clear then you don't have to so i normally don't unless there is a specific problem like they have a genital problem otherwise not really needed see an endocrinologist might because their assessment requires them to also physically examine the genitalia so endocrinologist might want to do the whole examination okay all right and do uh, uh for for a sex change surgery or any genital surgery we need a second gd certificate right from an independent psychiatrist so how does that go how long uh, how many sessions do you require for that 
and no second is from a second psychiatrist yeah yeah so that will also take only one or two session one session and at the most two okay all right see if the so, history is very clear and unambiguous one session is more than two. okay all right yeah. and um, lot of us yeah. are scared of the society and try to live our life in a, all our life in a classroom which is very stressful could you explain some long term and short term health effects of living in such constant stress yeah uh, see one is you are not happy living the life which you think is not the correct like uh you are a trans person and you are aware of it and to live act like a cis person is going to be difficult uh so one is there can be secondary like dysphoria means sadness mild sadness so it can even develop into severe depression and worse is if some people give in to family pressure and get married that that's going to be much worse so we see people like that also when they it, it's it happens with sexual orientation issues also sexual identity where they can't say no to parents because parents are providing and they get married it becomes a mess so living without revealing living in the closet can be constantly giving you a background problem unless you channelize it to completely into your profession something else it's going to be a nagging problem and does this stress lead to any other physical uh, health problems like diabetes or hypertension uh did you ask me are they more prone no i was saying because living in a constant state of stress does this also lead to any physical oh, health no not no, no. normally stress can cause but not uh, stress due to living inside the closet no okay. that doesn't the no study which says that living in the closet increases your risk of diabetes it doesn't say okay all right so only the psychological consequences okay yeah. and um no i can hear this very well so maybe phone can be off come back when uh, i can't hear this part. okay all right yeah thank you sir yeah. and a lot of psychiatrist asks for something called as roshash test do you ask for something like that for gender dysphoria and why is it related to gender dysphoria i i don't ask for see roshak is a in blood test like it will be like a random abstract picture and the psychologist will ask you to tell you what do you see there and all that it's a old test has some utility in some problems but most often no i rather believe in a clinical interview where you talk to a person and find out rather than trying to unravel something which they didn't even know and they saw it and it came out so even leave alone for transgender kind of problem even for other issues i don't use such because sometimes when you not cannot make a diagnosis not leave alone this i'm talking about general psychiatric patients if you can't make a diagnosis clearly it's too compli- complicated and you do a roshak even that results will be complicated because what the patient tells you will is what will come up so you don't need that to make a diagnosis of gd that in my opinion so i don't use that and even in any kind of guidelines it doesn't say you need to do a roshak to come to a conclusion okay and is there something called as gender identity assessment scale and how is it uh no i i lost your voice quality can can you pick up the mic maybe near oh, yeah, by sure, sure, that might sure. help uh so what is uh, is there something called as gender identity assessment scales because we've heard it from some psychiatrists and is it something relevant and how is it used in gd evaluation do you know hmm 
Now I think we lost the doctor. So let's just wait for some more time. Hello? Hello, yes. Uh, yeah. I, I was frozen for some time. Yeah. 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 Now we can hear you, doctor. So uh, my question is, we've had heard from some psychiatrist about something called as a gender identity assessment scale. Uh, do you know anything about what is it? And can you explain us why is it relevant in GD evaluation? Um, one second. I... Maybe it's a connection issue. I'll connect through another. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, we, we can hear you. Can you hear us, sir? Hello. Hello. Can you hear us, sir? Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. Can you hear us? Yeah, I, I've come through another connection. Ah, okay. All right. Yeah, so better, much uh, yeah. my question was, we've heard from some psychiatrists about something called as a gender identity assessment scales. Uh, do you know what it is and how is it relevant See, in GD? There are assessment scale for practically everything. Standardized scales. Uh, I don't use it. Like, for example, OCD has scales to measure, especially like I don't use it routinely in my clinical practice. But if you're doing research with drug therapy or psychotherapy to monitor change, you need to use those scales to have valid results. So in those cases, like for depression, there are scales, assessment scale, anxiety, there are assessment scale. But then in a clinic, we don't sit with a scale and say, OK, you've got 17 out of 35, so you've got depression. No, I'll rather talk to you and find out whether you have mild, moderate, severe. I'm not going to use a scale so scales are used in research either for assessment in a large scale study population or when you are giving an intervention and you're assessing at various points of time scales come handy when you have non-professionals using it like for example it is a large group of people who are being screened for depression and a non-psychiatrist might be using them so they need a little bit of training to how to use the scale so in routine practice, I don't use scales because most of the questions in the scale would have naturally come into your interview questions itself. So I, I don't use scales. Okay. But if you search, you might get, I'm not aware of gender identity disorder scale, but there are scales. I think we lost the doctor again. Uh, let's see if it uh, if it connects back. And uh, yeah, let's wait for a while.
in the meantime we uh, if anyone wants to doctor contact dr uh, mohan raj here is his number and um, he is a very good psychiatrist and uh, uh, yeah he'll help you to get the gd certificate and go ahead with your gender transition and uh, so in the meantime i'll tell you a bit of story about uh, how my gd certification went so when i came out uh, and yeah i finally had wanted to transition um i uh, i saw a psychiatrist in in uh, in the place where i lived and there were many uh psychiatrists who denied even outrightly seeing me and they wanted to correct me and all that because this was way earlier in 2006 um uh and uh, finally a psychiatrist saw me and uh, he was he was nice uh, oh yeah doctor is back hi hi sorry hello Bye. not a problem doctor yeah not a problem yeah, no, so uh in the meantime i Okay I'll ask you the last question last two questions that we have one is uh, uh, now for a lot of us transgender people we know we feel this way but the question is but why why do i feel this way is there any compelling scientific hypothesis or uh, why are certain people born as trans or is there any neurological underpinnings that makes us feel this way do you yeah uh, there is a lot of research that have looked into this uh, they haven't found any neurological structural changes uh, biochemical changes in the brain they haven't found any hormonal changes so there were a lot of theories they have looked into all that they couldn't find out so then they have these psychological theories which again is very difficult to prove but Uh, structurally neurologically neurochemical underpinnings nothing is there and there are a lot of theories about growth being brought up how they are exposed what kind of toys they are but all these are theories which can't be like said this way or that way sometimes like it's that if you grow up with an elder sister and sister's friends and the boy is exposed to only girls toys this one theory but i can't really take it as it is it is there so for me it's just a theory it's not true so but uh, biochemically physiologically no they have not found anything genetic studies also haven't shown anything okay at this point of time yeah yeah okay that's good to know and uh, how do you stay informed and up to date with current research and best practices in the field of transgender health how does you stay up to date um see one is reading articles then i'm part of psychiatry groups where people post if there is a research article something which is ground breaking and obviously it will be posted like nimans alumni group is there other psychiatry groups are there so anything ground breaking not in transgender anything in mental health anything new happening somebody will post an article a link apart from we going to journals looking for articles this also happens right okay. so that is one then we have conferences cme is continuous medical education where people will be presenting data new data so that is another one okay and i have one last question that is uh in presence of some other mental health comorbidities how does the evaluation of gender dysphoria go ahead how does it complicate the evaluation yeah 
See, if they have another comorbid psychiatric problem, it's mandatory we treat it before we think about gender dysphoria. Like, for example, if they have a psychotic disorder, it's then we need to treat the psychotic disorder before, because if they have multiple other delusions, this or could also be a delusion. So when there is schizophrenia or delusional disorder as a comorbid condition, obviously we are not going to give a certificate. We need to concentrate on that and treat. Now, if there is severe depression, and if the depression is due to gender dysphoria, then treating depression itself will make things better and they'll have a clear because they're making some major life decisions and major life decisions are to be taken without too much influence of extreme emotion. So if they're severely depressed, treat depression, then evaluate for gender dysphoria. Okay. And does this OCD also or sustain? Increase? If they have OCD, concentrate on the OCD, treat OCD, then evaluate. Okay. And does that increase the timeline that takes for the gender dysphoria evaluation then? Uh, no, your sound is going off again for me. Ah, okay. Uh, does that uh, also affect the timeline for the diagnosis or evaluation of gender dysphoria? Uh, you're asking, is there a timeline? Yeah, it does it affect because otherwise you said one or two sessions are enough. So, yeah. See, as I said, if it's very clearly gender dysphoria, yeah. see, a person who comes to me is not going to suddenly come with a first thought for us to dig deep and find their gender dysphoria. They would have spent months, sometimes years before they read up about gender dysphoria, they read a lot. So, they're fairly well informed yeah so since they have been reading a lot they are able to clearly tell what they are going through okay all right okay doctor thank you very much for your uh, awareness about gender dysphoria and helping transgender people to go ahead with their transition because this is not something all the psychiatrists in india do yet uh, there's a lot of stigma, a lot of taboo, a lot of uh, misinformation even that help, that creates as a barrier for transgender patients to seek support. So thank you for yeah. being there and thank you for thank you. Uh, being one of the pioneers in helping transgender people. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me today to share a few words. Thanks. And to all our viewers, thank you for joining with us. We hope next time we have another interesting uh, doctor or a lawyer who can help us with some more information about transgender people. Thank you very much. Bye.